एट हाँ हाँ चले गए चेक करना आगे इनको बोल देता हूँ ना कि लाइव है स्टार्टेड बोल दूंगे अब लाइव हो गया तो डीला है बोल सर वी आर लाइव यस Okay. Uh, very good afternoon to all the attendees today. Uh, my name is Pramod Tawar, and uh, this is uh, the fourth session of the Jigyasa lecture series. And uh, today we have with us uh, two reputed uh, scientists of CSIR series. So, uh, just to update uh, about the Jigyasa mission again, so the Jigyasa mission was uh, launched by. honorable uh, prime minister of india shri narendra modi ji and uh, since then we are conducting uh, uh, various activities under this sikyasa uh, mission these activities are uh, usually conducted for school students the faculty uh, the school faculty and uh, other learners who wish to learn about the new technologies and so uh, in this session we have with us uh, dr t ishwar and dr vijay chatterjee who will be speaking on uh, the respective topics so uh, just to introduce about uh, dr t ishwar dr t ishwar received his msc degree in physics stream from usmania university in 2019 he has done his uh, ntech in solid state uh, materials from department of physics indian institute of technology delhi in 2011 thereafter he completed his phd in plasmonics for silicon solar cells influence on optical and electronic properties of devices from center of uh, center for energy studies iit delhi he joined as a scientist in sensors and nanotechnology group uh, csir cd in 2016 currently he is uh, continuing as a senior scientist in semiconductor device fabrication group at the same lab his current research interests are flexible tactile sensors flexible transparent electrodes heaters plasmonics for light manipulation mocvd growth of wide band gap materials he has more than uh, 10 publications in reputed journals uh, to his claims so uh, going ahead with the presentation and uh, the like popular lecture by dr t ishwar i welcome dr t ishwar to continue with the talks ishwar can you please take over yes sir and if you have any uh, queries or questions uh, please uh, uh, you can type either in the chat box of the youtube session uh, after this session we will be enabling it for say 10 minutes and uh, uh, arvind just uh, do Uh, recall to uh, enable the chats uh, before the 10 minutes this session ends thank you over to ishwar thank you ishwar please continue uh, so am i audible yes you are thank you sir thank you for the generous introduction uh, let me share my ppt Yes. Yeah, it's visible. Yeah, it's visible. Okay. So, yeah. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the generous introduction. Okay. Uh, myself, Ishwar. So today, I'm going to talk about biological skin to electronic skin, the role of mechanoreceptors. So, uh, if you look at the first popular lecture series of this Jigyasa, so that was by uh, Mr. Navjot Singh. So it was started with Uh, enos he touched upon enos and uh, e enos and uh, it tan okay so and this session almost like end of this session is going to start with e skin e skin so it looks like there is a lot of inspiration coming from 
the biological organs, the functionality of different biological organs, be it electronic nose, electronic tongue, or electronic skin. So today, so I will discuss briefly about biological skin. So what kind of mechanoreceptors are there in the biological skin? From the point of view, from the electronics point of view, I will also uh, from that too I will discuss with electronic skin. So how we are realizing electronic skin? Uh, that uh, the inspiration we are bringing from this biological skin. As we know, skin is the largest organ of our body uh, in terms of area. Second, uh, in terms of surface area, it is the second largest organ of our body. First is the like uh, the small intestine. So here is a picture it is shown here just to give some glimpse of this showing of skin. Okay. So he is the person from UK resident. He is a UK resident having some skin disorder. You know, he can stretch his skin up to six inches. Just imagine. So for that, he got some Guinness World Book of Records also. So the skin is the largest organ of the, our body. So even average human being like us also, we can stretch our skin up to few centimeters. So skin is having some interesting properties like stretching up to some extent you can stretch it it can also say feel in addition to that there are some interesting properties the skin can protect our internal organs from outside like dust pollutants virus bacteria outside temperature outside the harsh environment and so on so it can protect from various things also it has different sensations, like sensations, something like touch sensing, temperature sensing, vibration sensing, and we can we can feel smooth as well as hard subjects, something like that. Also, the skin is can regulate our body temperature. Most of most of us we can feel that in summers we feel different. You know, our body sweats like more, but in winters this situation becomes different. So in summer, what happens when the temperature rises, our skin start to sweat out. So when there is a sweating, when that sweat start to evaporate, the skin surface start to cool down. So in that condition, so the blood vessels under our skin start to pump, you know, they become blood vessels in, under our skin become white and they can pump more blood into the near to the skin so that uh, the blood can cool down and the maintain the uh, the temperature of our internal body. So if you talk about internal temperature, almost like uh, the healthy human being may have around 37 degrees Celsius of human body temperature, even few degree change from normal temperature like 37, 35 or 36. So we started feeling, you know, different uh, symptoms. So in cooler temperature, like when we are in the winter, so our the blood vessels under skin become they become narrower leading to less blood flow to, near to the skin so that way they can retain the heat in the temperature okay so skin also helpful for regulating body temperature also we know when our skin exposed to sun it produces vitamin d so vitamin d is like essential vitamin for calcium absorption in an LD individual. So these are the few few important properties of our skin. It protects, it senses, it senses different stimuli, temperature, it regulates body temperature, it produces vitamin D and so on. So when it comes to the electronics, so we always try to mimic the properties of skin like electronic nose and electronic tongue, tongue, electronic skin. We'll try to mimic the, some of the properties of the skin. It is not, part of, not possible to mimic the body temperature regulation property or vitamin production of vitamin D property, but it is possible to mimic the properties of this sensation. Touch sensing, vibration sensing, temperature sensing. This sensing properties can be possible uh, we can mimic the properties using some electronic components so we'll focus on this sensing properties of the skin today how our human receptor system works 
if we look at the microscopic view of our skin it essentially have a two layers epidermis the outer layer and the beneath that there is a dermis layer and beneath that there is a subcutaneous system that we are not going to discuss today so these two layers this epidermis is in the direct contact with the environment or when we uh, perform different uh, tasks so between these two layers between the interface between two layers and within the dermis layers there are different receptors are there and this epidermis and dermis they are having an interface the interface is not like a flat interface but kind of interlock interface it is having uh, corrugated structure something like this this so this increases the basically surface area of the interfaces when we have a flat area when we have the corrugated structure the surface area increases in the case of this kind of corrugated structures so what will happen if we have this kind of structure we can accommodate more receptors so that the skin can have more receptors so if we talk about different mechanoreceptors there are uh, mainly mechanoreceptors thermoreceptors and a nociceptor nocic nociceptors these kind of receptors are there in the dermis the mechanoreceptors are mainly responsible for mechanical stimulus measurement and the thermoreceptor for temperature measurement and the nociceptor for pain you know we can sense it can sense pain using this nociceptors so here we'll focus on this only the mechanoreceptors further if we classify into different mechanoreceptors there are different kind of mechanoreceptors starting from meissner corpuscle pezinian merkel cell ruffini hair and nerve fibers free nerve ending fibers and all so these are located at different locations of these dermis further these mechanoreceptors can be classified into fast adapting and slow adapting fast adapting type 1 and fast fast adapting type 2 slow adapting type 1 and slow adapting type 2 so if we look at this location of these receptors fast adapting type 1 and slow adapting type 1 these are located at the interface between epidermis and dermis the others are located at the deep inside this dermis also the hair and free nerve endings are located so their function is different we we'll look into one by one so how this receptor respond to different stimuli for example here is a temperature time versus temperature cycle is given okay initially it is 35 degree now it is decreasing to 31 and then 35 degree celsius for this particular thermo thermo stimulation stimulation how this cells generate potential those that is nothing but action potential potential is nothing but voltage impulses if you look at the response corresponding to this temperature cycle over time with cell potential for 35 there is a negligible cell potential the spikes are like having very less intensity but for low temperature like 31 degree celsius the cell potential if we can see the spikes are like having more intensity and then when it reaches again 35 then it is normal that way the cells can generate action potential that is corresponds to the various stimuli be it temperature here in the case of temperature but it can be a pain 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 uh, pain stimuli or mechanical stimuli so further if we look into further if we look into this slope adapting type 1 type 2 fast adapting type 1 and type 2 their field range is different like the sa1 and fa1 which are having very small field range of field is very small like 2 to 3 mm which are located the interfaces which are responsible for measuring static forces with high resolution as well as to identify like slip detection edge detection and to identify fine feature of some objects like if you wanted to you know identify a smooth object or some rough object you know these slow adapting one and fast adapting adapting one these receptors are responsible for that kind of information identifying smooth or rough kind of information the other like sa1 slow adapting two and fast adapting two which are located at the deep in the those the range of field is quite large compared to these 
slow adapting type 1 and fast adapting type 2 which are responsible for measuring stretch if you stretch your skin you can you can feel it right that is because of this sa2 slow adapting type 2 receptor and to where you know suppose our mobile is vibrating we can sense it vibration we can sense how how it is coming it is from the fast ad fast adapting type 2 uh, receptors so how this generator you know this uh, type 1 and type 2 mechano receptors they generate stimulus if you look into it here is a small mechanical stimulus step like mechanical stimuli first there is a no stimuli then gradually increasing and with time the stimulus amplitude is like constant this is nothing but this is a static stimulus and this is dynamic stimulus and then suddenly coming down so for this particular mechanical stimuli if you look into this action potential with time if you for a slow adapting type 1 we see it generate action potentials for both dynamic force dynamic mechanical stimuli as well as for static stimuli here we can see similarly slow adapting type 2 also generate for dynamic as well as static they generate action potential throughout the action on the other hand the fast adapting type 1 if we look into it during the dynamic cycle only they generate action potential on the other hand for the static for static mechanical stimuli there is no stimuli at all here in the case of fast adapting type 1 as well as type 2 also during the dynamic stage starting one starting starting stage as well as at the ending stage it can generate action potential but in between here also dynamic pressure also as well as static also they don't generate any action potential this gives an information and understanding that slow adapting are more suitable for this dynamic pressures and fast adapting type are more suitable for this dynamic for static they are not at all suitable so because they don't generate any action potentials at all if you look at the literature in order to mimic the electronic skin in order to mimic the electron natural skin properties using electronics we have to mimic these properties the properties of sensing static pressure as well as dynamic pressure so what kind of trans transduction mechanisms are there to mimic these properties if you look into carefully there are resistive resistive as well as capacitive type of pressure sensors are there strain sensors are there which are more suitable for static static pressure measurement and the piezoelectric and triboelectric type transduction mechanisms are more suitable for dynamic pressure sensing rather than static so to realize electronic skin the skin has to have the electronic skin has to have it has to be like multimodal it can be a combination of static as well as dynamic for for that we need resistive capacitive piezoelectric piezo, combination of these resistance resistive sensors or individual resistance sensors so initially for initial understanding when we combine all these transduction mechanism together this entire system becomes cumbersome from the sensing point of view as well as the electronics point of view that's why the researchers are mainly focusing on understanding the functionality of individual transduction mechanism like this two capacitive or piezoelectric or triboelectric i'm trying they are trying to mimic the properties of this natural skin if you look at further look into these receptors you know the receptors are these receptors are somewhere densely located somewhere spatially located in our entire skin like in our fingers in palm we can see they are densely populated like slow adapting one the intensity is more here they are densely populated here on the other hand here they are very sparsely populated similarly sa1 sa2 slow adapting type 2 throughout the palm they are equally distributed likewise likewise in our foot as well as on our lips also these mechano receptors are densely populated so that we can find we can have more information using touch we can almost 
we can have information about uh, almost all, all objects like something is smooth something is rough or something is fine so by just by touching we can feel it meaning that this kind of mechanoreceptors are densely populated in our skin to have uh, more resolution more resolution of information so further into you know without understanding the working of these mechanoreceptors so we cannot mimic the properties of this mechano um, the, uh, these mechanoreceptors so since with this kind of skin uh, we have been handling different objects and we have we, we have been exposed to different environment since 1000 years but the basic working principle of how these cells are generating impulses to whether temp pressure or temperature or pain so this is like unknown since 1991 in 1990 in 1990s uh, like a two scientists david julius and uh, andrem patapotian so both of these these are us scientists they have explored or developed this kind of two type of genes trp1 and trpmh and piso1 and piso2 so these are the two mechanisms which are nothing but in individual these cells whatever cells we have seen previously in that cells in individual genes the ion channel movement because of this ion channel so this trp1 can feel something hot similarly this gene trpm this ionic channel you know ionic channel protein can identify something is hot or something is cooler okay so trpm is responsible for this when we feel something cool so this trpm gene is responsible for that and trp1 this is responsible for if something is hot if you can touch something hot and we can feel it means this is responsible for that similarly piso1 and piso2 type this ion channels are responsible for touch or proprioception you know for daily activities we hang around and we touch something we we we, we can lift our hand we can we can shake hand we can move our head so all of these perceptions are from this piezo type 1 and type 2 ionic channel proteins so uh, this like for this groundbreaking innovation so they have awarded Nobel prize in physiology or medicine in 2021 this is quite latest so before that this understanding was not clear coming to the mechano transduction mechanisms so which are like piezo resistive capacitive piezoelectric and triboelectric these are the widely used transduction mechanisms for realizing electronics yeah of course the other transduction mechanisms are also there like optical magnetic ionic but from the flexible point of view flexible electronics point of view these are the most widely explored transduction mechanism so working principle of these transduction mechanism will see one by one yeah if you start from the rigid electronics to flexible electronics thin skin is like flexible stretchable bendable or something like that so in order to mimic the properties of those the entire material has to be I mean, intermediates have to be like flexible or stretchable. For that, the standard materials or conventional semiconductor materials like silicon mm -hmm. chain, meaning these are all not suitable. So since they're from the fabrication point of view, as well as from the application point of view, like these materials are brittle in nature. So if you try to bend it, these material can break. So that's why so separate kind of materials different kind of materials are required for that so these are some materials organic materials like pdms ecoflex pvdf polyurethane polyethylene pet polymide these are some as a materials as a used as a substrate as well as some active materials the electrode materials can be like the conventional thin materials like gold silver or the nanowires can be used as a electrode materials graphene, ivo-coated pet or p-dot pieces. So these are some conventional materials 
which may not be suitable for this flexible electronics. So these are some materials used for flexible electronics development, which are normally used for electronic skin development. If you start with piezo resist to pressure sensors, I hope you have seen somewhere as these are conventional resistors. Conventional resistors are what? So if you look into the previous radios or TVs, not the latest ones, the older version one. So if you look into, you can find resistors something like that. These are the between two electrodes, some resistive material would be there. Based on that, the resistance of this material can be based on this color also can be estimated. Like two kilo volt, two kilo ohm or hundred kilo ohm, something like that. So these resistors are having resistance. The resistance of these resistance resistors are constant. But in order to develop piezo resistive pressure sensors, the medium medium has to be flexible. For example, here is a simple resistive medium between two electrodes. Elastic, some elastic resistive material we have keep it, kept it here. For this medium, the resistance can be estimated like resistance is like resistivity into dimensions of the material. For this material, when a pressure is applied, if the material is elastomeric material, this will undergo compression, meaning that there is a change in L and A. If L and A changes, the length or area changes, that leads to the change in the resistance. That's how this resistive pressure sensor works. More details we can see in the next slide. Here is the simple electrode. You know, further the piezo resistive pressure sensor can be divided into different types based on the tunability, sensitivity, or pressure range, or the hysteresis. If you look at it, these are like bulk piezo resistive pressure sensor, meaning that the, the resistive medium between two electrodes is like bulk, which is having a like mere uniform layer, uniform film between two electrodes. This can be a resistive medium or if, which can be a, a, a composite of two mediums like elastoma, which is a insulating medium with some conductive fillers. When a pressure is applied, the conductive fillers start to having interaction with the, each other. So the resistance changes. Initially, the resistance may be large like two kilo ohm. When a pressure is applied, this conductive fillers start to interact, start connecting each other, start connecting each other, leading to the changing resistance that meaning that the resistance from here to here decreases. That's how it works. But this kind of bulk materials have having some limitations. The like response time is more or hysteresis is more. In order to avoid these disadvantages, so people have come up with some different contact resistant type pressure sensors in which what happens rather than bulk medium the resistive medium is now microstructure something like this now this is conductive elastomer the contact area between this electrode and this electrode is a small point when a pressure is applied since this is elastomeric medium this will undergo compression it is simple like a rubber when you press the rubber it will undergo compression like that this will undergo compression now it is having more contact area, meaning that the resistance is decreasing from here to here. Now, based on the applied pressure, the contact area changes. Really, this is proportional to the change in resistance. That's how by incorporating this kind of microstructures here, 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 the response time can be reduced as well as hysteresis can be reduced. Further, tunability of pressure is possible. For example, here is a simple example of one electrode, ITO on PET. This is a one transparent electrode on which the micro pyramidal structure, a PDMS. PDMS is a polydimethyl siloxane elastomeric medium over which reduced graphene has been crafted. Now, RGO is a resistive medium. When the electric contacts are taken from here and here, 
based on the contact area with this pyramids micro pyramids and the bottom electrode the resistance changes for example initially the resistance is here this is a with applied pressure the change in resistance is shown here for a planar unstructured film we can see here how with increasing applied pressure the change in resistance but when these microstructures are introduced when these are structured now you see for a given applied pressure there is a huge change in resistance up to like less than 100 pascal but after 100 pascal now it is almost like the increase is like very small so now for small pressure now this sensor is very sensitive with sensitivity of almost like 5.53 per kilo pascal this so shows that by microstructuring you know we can we can have more sensitive pressure sensor like the unstructured one 0.1 kilo pascal but here after structuring now this is 5.53 there is a huge increase in this sensitivity that's why by microstructuring highly sensitive pressure sensor can be developed if we come to the piezo capacitive pressure sensor if you look into the capacitive conventional capacitive capacitors these are rigid capacitor between two electrodes some dielectric material insulated dielectric material is there between two parallel electrodes now so these are having fixed capacitance based on their requirement now this may be a 100 uh, this this may be a 1 kilo uh, based on the, uh, the based on the properties like it can be like 1 kilo pass uh, picofarad or nano ferro picofarad nano picofarad or microfarad uh, microfarad or kilo farad so depending on the requirement so this kind of conventional capacitors are available in the market for simple parallel plate capacitor the capacitance equation can be written something like this capacitance equal is equals to the relative permittivity of the material and the free space permittivity and the area and the spacing between two electrodes for a given capacitor if we change the separation between two electrodes the capacitance changes if we increase the d the capacitance decreases if the d decreases capacitance increases that's how this capacitive pressure sensor works here are some examples between two electrodes some porous dielectric medium is there when for a, for this material this may be having some capacitance when a pressure is applied this porous dielectric material undergo compression meaning that separation between two electrodes decreases that leads to the change in increase in the capacitance that's how this porous dielectric type sensor capacitive sensor works but compared to the bulk medium incorporating some pores into the dielectric medium or incorporating some microstructures like microdome here here the micro pyramid or some kind of tilted micro micro cylinders so compared to the bulk dielectric medium so these with these micro structures the sensitivity can be tunable as well as we can get good or a small response time is the sensors with small response time and sensors with small hysteresis also the other kind of pressure sensors are there like interdistrator rather than these are all parallel plate capacitive so here these are interdistrator type capacitive pressure sensors now with this capacitance pressure sensor people could able to develop pressure sensor with the sensitivity of width of almost like 0.55 kilo pascal inverse in this up to like 2 kilo pascals so here in this particular graph on x axis an applied pressure with change in relative change in the capacitance different type of microstructures have tried the capacitance graphs of different microstructures like uh, here the unstructured one and the lines and the pyramids compared to all of all from 
out of all of these metro structures and with the planar the pressure capacitive pressure sensor with micro pyramid one shows outperforming sensitivity compared to the other structures shows that the microstructuring is plays an important role while for better sensitivity Similarly, in the case of piezoelectric pressure sensor, between two electrodes, some piezoelectric material is, is there. When a pressure is applied onto it, since piezoelectric is a, some kind of materials are there, which shows, which exhibits piezoelectric nature. Based on that internal structure, they exhibit piezoelectric nature. When a, applied pressure, when a pressure is applied, for example, here is a neutral manacle, meaning that for this a uh, no external stress is applied now this is in stable condition but when a tensile stress or compressive stress is applied now this molecule start to distort meaning what the charges induced on the when this distorted in this direction now the positive charges are induced here and the negative charges are induced here similarly when uh, there is a compressive flare, compressive stress from this direction. Now the negative charges are induced here and the positive charges are induced here. So this way for a given applied pressure this can generate voltage. So that way this can work as a piezoelectric pressure sensor. Not all materials exhibit piezoelectric behavior only certain class of materials are there like ceramics, and single crystal polymer and polymer composite materials. Out of this, for flexible electronics, polymer and polymer composite, polymer and some metal composites are widely used for developing this piezoelectric pressure sensor. For this, a typical example, a PVDF CNT film sandwiched between two electrodes. Now this can give a spike kind of change in current. This is in pico ampere. This is for with different weight like 20 gram, 50 gram, 100 gram and 20 gram. We can see the increase in the amplitude. You know, if we start increasing upper pressure or tapping, the response increases. But here one thing we should not be here. It should be remembered that piezoelectric sensors, piezoelectric pressure sensors are more suitable for dynamic sensing. If you look at here, these are like old current spikes rather than having something here we, are, we can see the response in, in, in the form of spike meaning that for a dynamic pressure these are more suitable. For static, resistive and capacitive are more suitable. The other class of pressure sensors are triboelectric pressure sensors. Somewhere or in our childhood or now, almost we can experience this tribo, tribo electrification. That is nothing but contact electrification. When two dissimilar materials are rubbed together, some charge transfer will happen between here. For example, when we try to comb here, there is a charge transfer from here to comb, leading to one either comb is positively charged or negatively charged with respect to air. This leads to, if we take it to somewhere near to some paper, small pieces of paper that will start to attract, this comb start to attract those people. That is because of triboelectrification. Similarly, here is a good example. Cat fur, when a cat is playing with some kind of polymeric material, you know, the polymeric, these beads start to attract started to attach on the surface of this far. This is because of this triboelectrification, meaning that when these are rubbed together, the charges transfer from one material to another material. So this material can be used for pressure sensing as well as this triboelectrification can be used for pressure sensing as well as energy generation as well also. Based on different requirements. So here are for triboelectric pressure sensors or energy generation. People have suggested four type of architectures. Vertical contact separation mode, lateral sliding mode. So here's the 
these are the two triboelectric materials. The back side, this is an electrode here also. Now, when these are come into contact with each other, when they are connected and separated, when they are connected, charges start to exchange, and when they are separated, charges are induced on these two triboelectric materials. Now, this can be this induced charge can be harvested for pressure sensing as well as energy harvesting purpose. Like here, now this sliding, you know, one upon other by sliding also, this kind of charge induction can happen. And this freestanding triboelectric mole layer and single electrode mole layer. So these modes are more suitable for harvesting this kind of energy. For example, here for blue energy, like tides are touching and if we have some uh, energy generator based on this triboelectric uh, nano generator, the tides continuously come and touch your sensor, meaning that they can generate power. Like here, they can also be incorporated into the shoe lay shoe. So while running, you can generate the voltage from this triboelectric nano generation process using this vertical contact separation mode. Similarly, so different modes can be used for different energy harvesting or pressure sensing purpose. So for the for this triboelectrification process, efficient triboelectrification process, proper combination of selection of proper combination of materials is very important. So for that, there are certain kind of electron acceptor type of materials are there and donor type of materials are there. So we can choose combination of this and to develop triboelectric pressure sensor or energy generation. Here is a simple example where the nickel foam and silicon elastomer, these two materials are used as to develop triboelectric pressure sensor here. Now this is the sensor. If we tap with finger or palm or foot, even as we can also tap with foot, but tapping here, the change in the current you can see the micro ampere. With full finger tapping, there is a less current is there. With increasing with hand or foot, here we can see the more current current is being generated. So for this simple foot tapping, here we can see just a small nano generator can light few LEDs, meaning that if we can in an energy efficient triboelectric energy that is developed that can, all, can also be directly used to light few hundreds of LEDs. Here also we see time versus current for various applied pressures 0.4 Newton to 10 Newton. Just by increasing applied pressure, tapping pressure, we can see the current is increasing for almost like almost like 0.5 micro ampere to 2.7 micro ampere. So this way, the triboelectric pressure sensor sensors can be used for pressure sensing as well as for nano generation purpose. From the application point of view, since the electronic skin has various application, starting from here, a simple example of capacitive pressure sensor for post-surgical wireless monitoring of arterial, arterial health provision. Normally, conventionally, in order to check our BP, what we use, we use cuff-based inflated, inflated type of uh, spigmum manometer we use. But in some rare health conditions, that is not possible to attach spigmum manometer and monitor BP for longer time that is not at all possible. So in that case, we need some pressure sensors, pressure sensor sensors, something like this, that can be attached and leave it there for maybe few days or continuous monitoring of your blood pressure. So for that case, this kind of e-skin type of pressure sensors are useful. So for example, in this case, this is an artery of a rat over which a sensor is wrapped. The capacitive pressure sensor is wrapped. And see, this can be powered using simple antenna. Also, the information can be extracted through this antenna. 
Now, the entire materials are based on flexible material as well as biocompatible material. So, for implantable type of health monitoring devices, this kind of pressure sensor can be useful. Here is an another example of pressure sensor. This is capable of both normal as well as tangential forces. This is kind of multimodal. So normally, when the pressure sensors are developed, so normally the, the pressure sensors are developed for a single sensing. It can be a normal force or tangential force. Multimodal type are very complex and difficult to develop electrons. Further, there are few studies like this. These are capable of what is it is having a microdome structured elastomeric medium, one elastomeric medium, and then micro pyramidal based one elastomeric medium, and over which the electrodes are grafted something like this, rather than continuous a pixelated pixelated electrodes are fabricated something like this. If you look into this now. A normal forces up if, if a normal force is applied here we can see the response here a tangential force dif different degree from here to here we can see the response so what are the applications of this kind of pressure sensor since as we have discussed at the study the electron skin has to be multimodal type meaning that it has to it has to handle different objects for example, an electronic skin is attached to a robotic hand. Normally, robotic hands, conventional robotic hands, they don't have any tactile feedback. But if this kind of electronic skin attached onto this kind of robotic hand, what will happen? For example, here are the two cases. One with, with feedback and another one is not having any feedback. So here, this pressure sensor is attached onto this fingertip. So when this robotic finger is approaching this small fruit, when this is approaching, when it touches, it will readily identify the soft fruit. As soon as it identifies, it will go back to its initial position without damaging this fruit. But when this tactile sensing is not there to robotic finger, what will happen? without knowing this soft fruit, it will crush the entire fruit to damage. Meaning that these kind of multimodal type pressure sensors are required to have feedback, to have imp important feedback so that like delicate objects can be handled using robotic hand. So for that kind of application, so this multimodal type pressure sensors are useful. Apart from that, this piezoelectric PBDF multiwall carbonate composites can be used for monitoring of vital signs and muscle motion. For example, a sensor is attached, a PBDF multiwall carbonate tube based sensor is attached here just to have, just to record the information of this pulse wave. Here we can see the time versus voltage of a clear pattern of pulse wave. Also, just inhaling and exhaling, when the sensor is placed at the near to the nose, the inhale and exhale type of information in the form of spikes we can record here. Also, when it is attached on this neck, when you are speaking something or gulping something, when you are eating something, that kind of information can give. And when it attached on the shin, when you are speak different words, the response would be different, you know. So that can be used for monitoring of vital signs. Like when it is attached on the finger or hand or wrist, when you are moving wrist or moving finger, so you can have different information. You can record different information using this kind of piezoelectric based pressure sensors. Meaning that in future, for vital signs, this kind of pressure sensor can be useful. Here is an example of the previous one we have seen 
precious as a fur like implanted on your rat vein for in vivo in vitro pulse wave from recording but here pressure sensor a self powered pressure sensor for cuffless blood pressure measurement now this is a triboelectric type base attached one is at here and one it at the finger based on that we can record the pulse wave pattern this is pulse wave pattern here at the finger as well as at the here from comparing these two patterns a pulse wave velocity or pulse transit time can be extracted based on that bp blood pressure blood pressure of a person can be estimated now here two things like now this is the blood pressure data obtained from this self power pressure sensor and this is with cuff based pressure uh, cuff based blood pressure monitor if you compare both this kind of sensor almost giving identical data similar data to the cuff based pressure sensor showing the possibility of you know cuffless blood pressure monitoring for continuous monitoring of blood pressure using this kind of variable devices here is a self power tribo electric pressure sensor in some rare, rare health conditions measurement of and monitoring of person's posture or walking style is measurement is very important for example here is a copper based copper deposited hemispheres of some microstructure arrays and ptfe the other layer the combination of these two a triboelectric nano generator or uh, pressure sensor developed using combination of these two materials is shown here if a foot is placed here we can see we can map the force how much force is applied at different places at here and at here based on that in sub health conditions you can the posture can be monitored or your walking style can be monitored based on that the doctor can suggest what can be what precautions can be taken to avoid any adverse effects using posture or walking style Here is an other important multimodality: electronic skin using silicon ribbons. As I said, silicon is brittle in nature, but if you thin down the silicon wafer up to few microns, less than 10 micron, now that can also be like silicon ribbon that can also be bended or flexible. So here is the complete electronic skin. Electronic skin developed using silicon nano ribbons and some gold electrodes this electronic skin wrapped around a robotic arm it's a robotic arm over which uh, this electronic skin is crafted if we look into this this is having various strain sensors strain sensor humidity sensor pressure sensor temperature sensor and also a heater for various stimuli if you look into the application of this electronic skin what it can do first thing is whether here is a shake hand with this robotic hand whether it is softly you are touching the hand or hardly you are touching that can be identified also based on this tactile feedback you can easily handle delicate subject like like you can you can type similar to your natural hand or you can grasp some delicate object like a ball or like a egg you can feel hot or cold as well as based on your feedback for example here now this robotic hand hand can distinguish between a diaper is dry or wet with this change in the capacitance here when a diaper is dry the change in capacitance capacitance is like very low but when it become wet we see the capacitance is more more so this kind of robotic hands are more useful for helping of elderly as well as like infants here not only from the sensing point of view 
also for the sure treatment hello yes pardon dr ishwar sure this is pramod so, yes sir uh, i think uh, can uh, can you just wrap it in some 5 yeah, yeah, minutes minutes because yes, uh, uh, dr vijay is already waiting yes sir yes sir it's done it's done thank you so now this kind of you know this is also i have in here heat suppose a baby is feeling with cold so in that case the prosthetic hand can be used for uh, you know creating some warmth in the baby head or on the stomach so this kind of with multimodal electronic skin you know so various tasks can be possible this can be useful for a person with amputee or robotic or different like blood pressure monitoring or for different posture monitoring different application so with this i would like to thank you if you have any queries please you can hello yes yeah, dr ishwar thank you thanks a lot uh, for uh, this wonderful presentation so as of now i am not able to see any queries lined up here but uh, let me just congratulate for the you for the work which you have already uh, done so only point which i want to ask from you is perhaps all these as you said a skin is the largest organ in our body yes so uh, how you perceive that uh, because of the inventions in the robotics and uh, humanoid architectures and all that how do you perceive that uh, will it be feasible to have a complete skin on a robot uh, on uh, installed on the robot or something is it feasible as of now because it's flexible as well yes sir so if we talk about this multimodality of electronic skin uh, the most of the tasks are performed by hands yes so uh, if we can give this kind of touch sensing to this kind of um, to just to hands you know so uh, the even the robot can feel many many things it need not to be covered entire skin yes it's the largest organ of the, our body but need not to replace the entire thing or need not to have enter the body of the robot but so where the, the main functions are there like if a robot is performing many functions using just with hands okay so if we can give the touch sensibility those hands you know so it can it can it can be used for various applications you know robot can be multi textures and it can perform much better task for sure fair enough so you mean to say that uh, if uh, we have to use this thing only where it is required right? yes. so where we actually try to feel something where a role of skin is to play yes that uh, that was the answer which i was looking for because uh, we have the skin everywhere because it has to keep all the things packed in the same state right. Right? and in case of robotics and the other things this is not the case right. okay sure so i appreciate uh, your time and uh, thanks uh, i think the viewers from jigyasa team will be very much benefited from your presentation so thanks a lot for giving your time dr ishwar thank you thank you sir thank you so moving ahead uh, i would like to invite uh, our next speaker dr vijay chatterji my friend and it's an honor to introduce him uh, to uh, this uh, young jigyasa visitors of this channel so dr vijay chatterji received his mphil degree from ismu now it is iit dhanbad and uh, completed his phd uh, jointly from university of bristol uk where he performed his research work and uh, uh, got the degree from bit mishra rachi so he was awarded the prestigious commonwealth scholarship in 2012 later on he joined uh, csir cd as scientist in opto electronics and uh, moems group in 2016 and from that time we are actually uh, getting his valuable inputs his early research was based on studying optical properties of uh, nanophosphorus uh, studying various properties of allotropes of carbon and its family his current research focus is on simulations and mocvd growth of uh, 3 5 semiconductors gallium nitride ingan allium uh, aluminum gallium nitride based leds and their characterization for various applications he is an expert in designing various optical sensor systems he has published over 30 uh, papers in uh, various peer reviewed journals and conferences 
he's a fellow of iit senior member of itpally he's a life member of pssi and alumni in association of commonwealth scholarship commission he is involved as editor and reviewer for various journals and currently he is uh, playing a very good role in the technology business development at csi siri pinar so all to dr vijay chatterjee uh, dr vijay will, will be speaking on uh, uh, on the biological sensors thank you thank you very much sir for your kind introduction just share my slides give me one one minute please Yeah, are my slides visible? No, not yet. Is it now? It is moving. I think you need to reshare. Yeah. Yeah, I think now. So. Yeah. Okay. So my topic is uh, biosensors, the future of medical diagnosis. However, this is a very vast topic. to get accustomed in uh, within half an hour or possibly 40 minutes but i will try my level best to get as much as possible to deliver for the students now the content of my topic would be briefly the biosensors around introduction the working the basic components basic characteristics the types of biosensor and the applications and also i will like to give some glimpses of the work that we do at cdp learning so first is the introduction so what is a biosensor type of device used to measure biologically derived signals uh, we all know that when we were kids when we were in like uh, we were in ch we were child and then uh, doctor uncle used to visit our home and he was having some kind of sensors through which he diagnoses as if we are having some kind of disease or not so the most common type of biosensor you can put the name biosensor every one every single home has it is a thermometer uh, this type of thermometer usually we used uh, before some time these are mercury based thermometer these days it is replaced by this kind of you know like uh, digital uh, thermometers and you possibly can remember this type of gadgets your doctor uncle used to have and possibly even now doctors used to have this this type type of thing to to uh, understand what is uh, going inside to check the condition of lungs and all so this is uh, this is the device which uh, can measure uh, biological derived signals now there are other type of devices that senses using strategy that uses the science of biomimicry as for example artificial nose say many times we have seen sniffer dogs at bus stand uh, railway station airports what they do if they try to figure out something uh, you know unnatural that the forbidden items that are not supposed to get carried in those places if somebody is carrying those things then the dog starts barking now sometimes it is also possible that the dog may not have his day so he may miss uh, to smell possibly so now the researchers have developed certain uh, you know like uh, certain sensors which can possibly never have a bad day if if everything goes right right so electronic nose are are such devices which can help to to biomimic the functionality of our nose now a device it can be defined as a device that detects the presence of biomolecules there can be n number of such devices which can uh, help you to get understand the presence of a biomolecule now the most uh, like acceptable definition of bio sensors are a self contained integrated devices that use a biological recognition element in direct spatial contact with a transducer element to provide specific quantitative or semi quantitative analytical information now this is the most uh, like considered definition of biosensor if i say how can i uh, make you understand say for example we can see this kind of device where we have a small device a person is injecting some kind of samples to the open, opening of this device and at once this uh, laptop screen can give out a re result and that result can give us a indication whether the patient whether the person whose sample is getting examined is a diseased one 
or a or a healthy one, right? So uh, now uh, in in several uh, cities we have seen this kind of devices, uh, this kind of portable devices on a single stand. It, it carries almost all different kind of gadgets, and at once people can get diagnosis, right? Uh, for for the disease and all. Now I will go to my next slide. Uh, you know, like Leonard C. Clark Jr. He was considered as the father of biosensor. It was in 1956 that he discovered a, a blood, uh, like oxygen measuring unit in different uh, entities like blood, water, and other liquids. So uh, we should be thankful to Leonard Leland who has given the sense of biosensors to the world. And today we have like plethora of different kind of devices which are in the category of biosensors. Now, why we require these sensors? What are the limitations? We all have, we all know that we have five sense organs. Now, if I go to the sense organ that we human possess, uh, say for example, are my slides visible, Professor? Slides are visible, right? Yeah, they're visible, yeah. they're moving. Okay. So the science of sensor, why we require si these sensors? You see, like we have five sense organs, eye, ear, uh, skin, tongue, and nose. Now you see, like human eye is one of the beautiful things that nature has given to us. But it has its own limitation. If you see, this is this, this eyebrow is actually the different colors that we can see. So our vision is very limited within the range between ultraviolet and infrared. But Say, for example, if there are some, uh, uh, say, ultraviolet rays coming, which is dangerous to us, but we cannot see it. But we know today by the, by the advancement of the sensors that there are ultra wa ultraviolet waves which we need to get protected from, right? Similarly, infrared, we know the TV uh, remotes and all, they are operated using this infrared sensor type of thing. Then uh, our ear, you know, like a human ear, uh, we have a ca capability of of listening to a frequency range 20 to 20 kilohertz. Now, if something is going below this infrasonic or uh, uh, say ultrasonic level of sound, then we are not able to understand. We are not able to uh, get any hint of those sounds which are below and above the uh, our uh, hearing uh, capability. So we need some sensors to back up. Similarly, we can uh, measure heat, cold, and contact using our skin, but this is not enough. Sometimes we require even more sophisticated kind of you know, devices which can make us more capable in, in terms of understanding the nature of different, uh, say, surface possibly. Now, our tongue can taste sweet, salt, so bitter, and some other taste also, but this is not enough when we're talking about the the, the taste of any particular chemical or, or some other thing. So we require the sensing ability to get enhanced. Similarly, with our nose, we can smell flowers, mint, ether, camphor, and other things. But as, as I mentioned, we cannot smell simply and identify whether there is a presence of RDX or not, whether there is a presence of TNT or not, or whether there is a leakage of some chemical in a very precise, very small quantity. Say, for example, if, if you are inhaling uh, some poisonous gas, say for example, phosgene and others. So uh, before it reaches to a level which is which is beyond danger level, we cannot even predict the presence of those gases. So it is very important to add up, to to give uh, extra aid and to help us to understand uh, this thing better, right? So then there is a requirement of biosensor. Now I will try to make you understand the working of a biosensor. This is a a uh, cartoon kind of uh, representation that I have uh, shown here. Say, for example, I have used a beaker. It can be anything. And you see, like, we have given some kind of analyte. Now, what happens? This, these analytes are moving in, in, the, uh, in a sensor's
Hello. Am I audible? Hello. Yes, you are audible. Okay, there was some glitch on the internet. So sorry. Yes, yes, it was. So see now what happens that this is uh, as I, I was mentioning that this is a cartoon of of working of a biosensor. So here we are using a beaker, and this is the this is the sensor side. Now these analytes will be moving uh, throughout this uh, say con container. At the same time, we'll have some of the analyte which can get diffused into the sensor system. Now once they get diffused into that, it will be giving some kind of signal, and those signals can be detected using a detector. Now, what are the types of signal we can measure using this kind of biosensor? So it can be element of life. We can either uh, predict the uh, presence of DNA, protein. We can either uh, depict the presence of chemical indicators as of like glucose, which is the main cause of diabetes. It's not like the all glucose are the cause of diabetes, only the extra, now, wh whatever your body requires, anything beyond it can be a cause of diabetes. Like we can also measure the presence of nitric oxide, which is the main element in Parkinson's. Now also we can measure the presence of invaders like virus, bacteria, also DDT. DDT is a chemical which can disrupt cell function. Now, uh, now for the timing, what, what are the things that we want to measure is we want to measure the charge, we measure to measure, the, we want to measure the mass, we want to measure the redox potential, and also the optical index kind of thing. So apart from this, there can be other measurable things also, but right now we are confining ourselves for this particular lecture within this domain, right? Now, if I talk about biomolecules, so DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. This is nothing but a polymer chain consisting of four types of nucleotide. When they are stringed together, they make the DNA. And uh, for our general knowledge, our human DNA is 4 billion base pair long. So if I just show a schematic of say DNA, and if I consider a single diamond, if I consider a single diamond, this single diamond consists of phosphate backbone, it consists of sugar ring, it consists of nucleotide base. Now why I'm talking about this, is it is also very important for us to identify the type of biosensor which we require to get the signal from the analyte. So, and this uh, this structures are not arranged in a linear fashion, but they are arranged staggeredly, and they look something like this. And this is a uh, say, if I if I talk further, one such diamond consists. Uh, they are charged. Uh, not neutral, they are having negative charge. So one such diamond consists of one to two electron and they are having mass of 300 Dalton. This is a proton mass unit. Now, if we consider, as I mentioned that human DNA is four billion base pair long, if I consider only 100 and I want to measure the presence of, my, I want to measure my DNA and if you take only 100 pair, which is nothing compared to four billion base pair, if I take only 100 pair, the charge would be around 100 to 200 Q. Based on the pH, I'm not discussing on that, and mass would be around 30,000 Dalton. Now, if I want a biosensor sensor to measure this, I can either use mass-based sensors or I can use charge-based potentiometric sensor. Both can work when we want to get uh, something noticeable. Measure Yes, sir. Yes, 
it happened. But anyways, uh, yeah, yeah, it is there. It is there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, I was talking about this. This part was over. Now, when we're talking about glucose, the size is around one nanometer. The mass is around 180 uh, gram per mole, and the charge is also neutral. So we cannot just use a uh, mass-based uh, sensor. We cannot even use a normal potentiometry kind of sensor to detect the presence of glucose. Now, at this point of time, what we can do that glucose oxidase, there is chemical reaction and it will form H2O2. Now, when H2O2, you are going to allow H2O2 to sit on a surface of platinum and uh, definitely there will be some circuits involved. And if you allow uh, to pass 450 millivolt of, of potential, then it will give around 2 nano ampere of current. Now, today we have this luxury of having those uh, sophisticated instrument which can give which can give around uh, reading of uh, current as well as two nanoamperes. So you so it is very important for us to also understand what kind of biosensor we are using to detect what kind of signal, right? And now basic components of biosensor, as we all know that there are different components uh, that are very important for biosensors. So. Uh, one is the def definitely the analyte. Analyte, if I explain, analyte are the uh, analytes are the backbone of everything. Actually, analyte are the things which we want to measure. So, if we want to measure the contamination in, uh, say, blood, the blood is our analyte. There can be many information that we can get from blood. Similarly, sweat. Similarly, saliva. Similarly, some other thing. So, there are uh, similarly. Uh, you know, the, the pathological, they use urine, they use uh, excreta. So there are many things which can be termed uh, as analyte. Then the second component is the bioreceptor. Now, bioreceptor have a very sm uh, very special function. They are the, they are the uh, say, backbone of this entire, uh, say, you can say, component cycle. They will take the analyte and they will receive it and before receiving, we need to do some kind of surface functionalization or maybe we need some kind of surface modification uh, so that the bioreceptors bio are exactly knowing what kind of analyte they are going to receive and they can neglect all other analyte which are not of importance to them. So this, this uh, section is very important to understand. Then comes the role of the transducer. In transducer, like uh, to convert biological response into a measurable signal. So uh, your signal, your biology, uh, the analyte can give any particular uh, type of signal. It can be mass, it can be it can be light, it can be piezo uh, uh, kind of thing. It can be thermistor, it can be electrode. So transducer are the one which which actually converts the signal and to make it meaningful to your circuit. Now whatever signal you are getting at the transducer, those signal will be uh, will be drive to the detector. And then detector will do all sort of you know uh, arrangement to make it measurable, to make it readable, and then output signal will be given at the uh, given at the user end. So these are the basic components of a biosensor. Now next uh, uh, next we have the basic characteristics. Uh, all biosensors, whatever we are talking about, any biosensor that can come across. They are having this basic characteristics like they have to be highly specific for the analyte of interest. It is not like that the biomarkers or the or the say the bioreceptor they started taking all kind of say analyte. If they started taking all kind of analyte, then it is of no use for us because then there will be cross talking of different kind of signal and which can be very complicated for us to understand the actual information that we are interested. in. Similarly, it should be responsive in the approximate concentration range. So it is very important. I will talk, I will, uh, when I will talk about the future diagnosis, I will, I will mention about this particular part. So it is also very important that it has to be very responsive. And that too with the concentration that we are talking about. Have a moderately fast response time. It is also very important for a sensor to give a result that too in a very uh, speedy manner. It's not like that you give a sample and the 
sensor is giving you a result maybe two days back that is of no use for us right similarly it has to be very reliable whatever data the sensor is giving it is to be it uh, like it, it is it is to be reliable you know we we need to rely on those data it's not like it is giving us random numbers and which are highly unreliable it is it is very important that the sensor should be reproducible like the the results should reproduce like it's not like today it is functioning well and tomorrow it is not functioning so then this kind of devices are not at all acceptable so the the sensor should be reproducible the results must be reproducible it must be accurate it must give the result up to a, definitely there will be certain kind of tolerance but within the tolerance should be the within the acceptable limit so it has to be accurate it has to be sensitive it must be sensitive towards the present of the analyte if the analyte is there and if the sensor is not identifying it then also the sensor is of no use so the sensor has to be sensitive towards the analyte and also the the important point is it has to be miniaturizing right so if we have the bulk kind of say uh, earlier we used to have bigger bigger machines so it is not possible uh, today we are talking about point of care devices so the point of care devices means that device can go to the patient's bed now if there is a bulky machine which is uh, there to measure say for example blood glucose level and other and if cannot reach the patient's bed then the patient has to move all the way to the hospital so now the approach has changed and we are more looking about like miniature version of biosensors so this is also very important this is one of the basic characteristics of biosensor now 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 there could be different types of biosensors so uh, it can be possibly based on the biological element what kind of biological element we are detecting it it, it can be dna enzyme biomimetic biomimetic it can be antibody it can be many other things and based on the trans transacting method we can have it can be either mass based uh, also in mass based we have piezoelectric magnetoelectric in piezoelectric also we have quartz crystal microbalance surface acoustic wave so all these are uh, different kind of mass based uh, transducer uh, say methods which give signal from say for example uh, if there is a change in mass say for example you are uh, as we are talking about uh, dna so they have a uh, say mass around 300 dalton so they can be measured using this mass based tra uh, transducers then you can have optical measuring method they can be fiber optic based they can be surface plasma resonance based they can be raman or ftr they can be others like fluorescence like photonic crystals and some other kind of uh, optical system also we can have similarly for electrochemical uh, we have we can have potentiometric as we have mentioned in the case of dna we can use potentiometric amperometric as uh, when we are talking about glucose sensor that is uh, we can use amperometric then conductometric there will be change in the conductivity conductivity level of the circuit then impedance the impedometric like there will be change in the impedance so th there are many such devices which are working on the principle of impedance so uh, any question further uh, will be uh, will be highly appreciated now we are talking about the application part of of different biosensors now biosensor has enormous application capability now most common it is like uh, uh, most commonly it will be used for healthcare checking metabolites measurement screening for sickness insulin treatment clinical uh, diagnosis in military agriculture veterinary application drug improvement uh, processing and uh, monitoring of industry ecological pollution uh, in clinics in industry and in interact study and interaction of biomolecules it is also very important during the development of drug it is uh, for the detection of crime also like we are using in the forensics uh this kind of sensors can be very important very useful for the detection of crime then medical diagnosis as we already we have mentioned there are different kind of medical diagnosis that we can uh, have using uh, the biosensors then we uh, monitoring of environmental field already mentioned quality control uh, say food and other thing also we can say if uh, today we are using frozen food we are using packet food so you can also use this this kind of biosensor 
to monitor the quality of the food inside those food packets uh, then process control in industries and uh, pharmaceutical manager of organ replacement so it is also very important that uh, uh, these kind of sensors are also used in organ replacement now today we are using prosthetic some kind of devices are also implanted inside like strands and other thing and people are also uh, now the science is advancing towards uh, making say artificial kidney kind of thing so these are to be tested somewhere so those involvements can be produced using a biosensor and exactly mimicking the human body condition and to see and analyze how these organs are uh, to be placed and this can be used as a organ replacement so these are the different uh, scopes of uh, say biosensor now uh, we are using an an optical biosensor so i'm i'm showing you one one such example so you see uh, like uh, photonic crystal uh, based uh, say i will give two two examples one is photonic crystal based and another is fluorescence based so in uh, photonic crystals are periodic dielectric structure that are designed to form the energy band structure for photons which can either allow or can stop the light to enter into that so what happens when you have this periodic structure so say for example uh, let me add the cursor there's a pointer so say for example if i see uh, say for example say this is my uh, photonic crystal kind of arrangement now what happens you see that this kind of optical arrangement is required where we have a light the light is going all the way from the source to the detector site in between there are optical arrangements like we have collimator we have polarizer we have photonic crystal we have uh, some kind of lens to uh, convert the light, light on the on the de detect detection site we have gratings we have the, the, this is a mimic version of smartphone now what happens that when there is no analyte present on the surface of the photonic crystal now when at this point when we measure a signal it will it, it will come like this now once you apply some kind of analyte on the surface of this uh, photonic crystal there will be a change in the refractive index of this material now because these are very specialized material on the on the change of on the change of the refractive index the functionality of these devices will change now what will happen now once we apply the analyte you see there is a shift in say this this was the prior signal now the next signal has been shifted towards in this picture towards the right side now on the basis of this shifting we can all we can first thing is we can qualify that there is a presence of any analyte in the vicinity of this within the within the measure measurement domain second thing is the the shifting will also indicate the concentration of the analyte present say for example if the shifting is large that means the concentration is large and there is a large change in the refractive index possibly Uh, after some time they will get some kind of saturation limit but initially they will show that that shifting and moreover uh, the the this will also give us an indication of the presence of the analyte now this analyte as i already mentioned it has to be pre functionalized only the analyte of interest will get get attached other thing will get removed from the surface so whatever signal we are getting is just because of the presence of the analyte of interest in a second case uh, we have designed a handheld fluorescence kind of uh, detector optical detector you see like this is the zone where we are actually placing a cassette what we are what we are naming it as a cassette now this cassette has all the thing that is necessary uh, we are injecting the 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 analyte everything in this cassette you see the dimension of this cassette i am showing here it is this is a 5 rupee coin and this is a normal scale you see how smaller these are and you insert this with your sample and you allow light to pass 
and based on the interaction of light with this biomolecule you are getting a specific signal now if the signal what we are getting after interaction with this analyte if there is no analyte we will be getting no signal and if we are getting any signal definitely there is a analyte present and based on the pre functionalization or the pre conditioning of the surface we can say that whether there is a presence of some virus some kind of other uh, say disruptive cell so we can identify the presence of those biomolecules so this is uh, with the optical sensor now i will talk about the future now हेलो आर बाय स्लाइड्स मूविंग सर नो डीसी अभी डाउन अभी एकदम से जाम हो गया एकदम से पर फ्यूचर ओके फ्यूचर टारगेट ऑफ बायोसेंसर नाउ वी सी इफ वी इवर कम अक्रॉस ए मेडिकल रिपोर्ट ऑफ ए हेल्दी पर्सन और और ए पर्सन डिजीज पर्सन the normal blood report always contain information in the range of millimolar per liter range which is too high in numbers now how why i am saying this now the the target of the next generation biosensor is to reduce this gap and we need to come across all the way from millimolar to femtomolar level now when we when we think about molar concentration this is actually the avogadro num avogadro number of molecules per liter if you think about a small box that is 100 micron size of a स्मॉल बॉक्स दैट इज अराउंड हंड्रेड माइक्रॉन एम आई ऑडिबल Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are audible. Okay. Yeah. So, 100 micron size cell, or let's say large cancer cell. Then we have on a micromolar scale. Say, if we are considering a 100 micromolar uh, box of cancer cell, in a one micromolar, we can have 100, 1 billion particles of the cancer. Now, same if we use for one picomolar, it is around 1000. Now. if we consider one femtomolar it is one so it is very important for us to arrest a disease at the very beginning now when we are considering to measure it in one micromolar it is almost 1 billion so even if you measure it we are actually coming out of that safe zone now if it is one picomolar so what is one picomolar if i say it is like dissolving a grain of salt in a several olympic size swimming pool so it is that big now if by any means we can measure the presence of a cancer particle cell in femtomolar level when it is just one so think about that advancement and think about the say possibility of of the survival rate of a patient now second thing as we all know that we all sweat sweat can be source of next generation digital biomarkers so you see this is a normal picture taken from internet so this person is sweating for us it is a normal sweat but what is there with the eye of a 
biosensors. So today we all use Fitbit kind of devices, but these are very limited devices. They can uh, give you indication of only two, three uh, vital signals, like it can give you, uh, say, dissolved oxygen, it can give the heart rate, it can also give some kind of, say, um, now easy kind of, say, pulse rate and other thing and uh, and uh, say uh, steps that we are taking and this normal uh, explanation but what is in the future is suppose if a person is doing some kind of exercise now this device with the help of his sweat can detect the presence of ammonia now if i am working out whether i am working my burning my calves whether I'm burning, burning my fat or actually I'm burning my muscles. These informations are very critical for an athlete. So now if we have some kind of biosensor which can detect using your sweat that what is the signal, where from the signal is coming. Now, uh, also electrolyte, when to drink, what to drink and how much to drink. Say for example, if we are doing an exercise, say for 40 to 45 minutes, Normal water is good enough to keep us hydrated. But if we are doing the exercise more than 45 minutes, then normal water is not enough to, to, uh, to keep us hydrated. We need some kind of sports drink. So what is, what is in the future is like these sensors are developing in such a manner that these sensors are taking control of almost everything. So I think uh, the future is really uh, showing great signs of uh, great development in the area of biosensor. With this, I would like to stop uh, my lecture because we are actually uh, very late with this. So thank you very much. I would like to answer if there is any query. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vijay. Uh, thanks for this wonderful presentation and uh, expressing your views and telling all our students uh, and the faculty members about uh, this uh, biosensors. I think that is a wonderful presentation. Uh, going ahead, uh, if we had any queries, uh, then we, we will be taking it on emails because as of now, I am not able to see any queries here. Uh, and uh, thank you and thank you all for attending this uh, Jigyasa webinar series. And uh, we'll be coming up with the new lectures shortly and we'll keep updating you on the uh, go. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ishwar, and thank you, Vijay. Th thank you, uh, Abhijit, sir, and uh, thank you, Arvind, for arranging this, uh, uh, coordinating all this uh, online event. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you all.